How many people do you know who struggle with their health? Chances are, whether they show it or not, most of the people in your life do. And chances are, you're one of them. Whether you're dealing with anxiety, depression, endometriosis, acne, eczema, autoimmune, thyroid, Lyme, brain fog, fatigue, or any other symptom or condition, you're far from alone. Living with symptoms has become the new normal. So no more guessing games. It's time to get answers. Welcome to the Medical Medium Podcast. I'm Anthony William. Hey, everybody. We're talking about chemtrails. You might want to brace yourself for what's coming in this episode. It's a powerful episode that you really should be informed about. It's always about protecting our health in every way possible. And chemtrails, that's an area we have to cover. I have to give you guys a little warning though. After you hear this, you may never see the sky the same again. This is all information from Spirit of Compassion since I was a child. Naysayers, they can believe it or not. That's fine. Maybe somebody can call it a theory. I, look, we can call it a spooky campfire story if it makes people feel good. We can do that too. That's fine. But hey, when you hear what I have to say, just get ready. <laughs> Bottom line, you've probably done your research with chemtrails. Somebody has. Somebody must have, because there's people out there that are like, chemtrails, I know about those, and I've heard about those, and there's some information out there. And yeah, some of it's accurate. One of the accurate parts of chemtrails is that there are chemtrails, <laughs> that there actually are chemtrails. So I'm going to tell you guys what information isn't out there, and it's a lot. What Spirit of Compassion has told me, the deep secrets of the chemtrail game yeah, did you hear that? I said game? Yeah, a sick game. My first experience with chemtrails was as a child. And a friend of mine pointing out a contrail on the horizon, and my friend asking, what does your spirit say about this contrail? And that's what he said. I said, well, let me ask Spirit of Compassion. What is a contrail? And Spirit of Compassion said, there are contrails, and there are man-made poison trails where man is poisoning man. These are two entirely different things. Ever since then, I was intrigued. In fact, I was obsessed about it. Why on earth would man be poisoning man? That right there when I was young, I, 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 it was overload. It was overload. Why on earth would man be dumping poison on man. That was hard for me to receive as a child because that one right there just it didn't make sense. And even though Spirit of Compassion delivered me the harsh reality of chronic illness already as a young child, teaching me so many of the things that that I've lectured about over the years that people know about now that has been passed around because the health scene was so small for years ago. And all the information that got out there that was so like harsh reality of why women are sick and why men are sick, this was a hard one for me. It was a hard one when I received this as a child. I mean, I knew about rat poison. I knew about rat poison that kills rats, right? <laughs> rat poison, I was afraid of it. I was afraid of rat poison. You just don't want to play with that stuff. I knew about insect poisoning too. My neighbors, they sprayed it out of a can. So this prompted me to constantly ask Spirit of Compassion, what's that mark in the sky? What's that plane? What is that streak in the sky? What is, what is this? And Spirit would say, that's a passenger plane. That's what that is. That's a passenger plane. And that's a cargo plane there. I'd be like, well, what's that plane? You know, a couple hours later, what is that one? You know, well, that's a third type of plane. You got your passenger planes where people are on them. You got your cargo planes where they're delivering packages and everything else, right, and all that. And there's other little tiny planes, you know, that fly around or private planes, little ones and all that. But big planes I'm talking about, big ones. And there, then there was this third plane. 
<laughs> and we'll get to that in a little bit about that third plane. Now, there is a big difference between a contrail and what people have named now a chemtrail. So, hey, I learned it as man-made poison trails. That's what Spirit of Compassion said. And now, I guess they're called chemtrails. And it's a good name for them, too. I like that name. I do. Contrails, contrails are fuel burning and heat exchanging from a plane. It's this heat coming out of engines. Okay, so when you're entering a higher altitude and you got that fuel burning, emitting all of that different vapor, and that air is cool as that plane is rising, and you, you, you can see these contrails out there. Yeah, there's this little tiny streak, and you see mostly contrails in the fall, contrails in the winter, on the horizon of the night sky, right? On the other hand, a chemtrail is something sinister, something dark, something dark in a despicable way that's even unimaginable, really is. It was for me as a child. And before I tell you what Spirit of Compassion has told me about the chemtrails, I got to bring you back into history a little bit to World War I, 1914, okay? And the world was at war. And a few years before the world was at war, a few years in the early 1900s, the chemical industry was birthing. It was birthing. They were experimenting with chemical concoctions. It was a brand new industry and fierce at that. For industrial use, World War I was the money and the fuel for the chemical industry to become larger, to ignite, to propel it was like the it was like the gasoline on the fire that war for the for the chemical industry so it became larger because the chemical industry was contracted to feed the war industry the global war industry they were hired to produce chemicals for chemical warfare and all kinds of other industries about war and this was all around the world and a surplus of these chemicals were stockpiled, storage bins of these chemicals. The chemical industry loves war. They love insects, too, now. They love rodents. They love machines. They love anything, and they loved all that back then. And everything that they believe needs a chemical. You might be wondering, like, why is he talking about World War I? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I got a real reason, and it's a powerful reason to so just hang on. And when I tell you guys fasten your seatbelts like I have in the past— you're going to want to fasten your seatbelts for this one. I mean, you really are. I, I would be sitting down for this show. But the war ended early with the help of the Spanish flu, right? You guys probably know that information there. The flu kind of knocked that war down. But, hey, that disappointed the chemical industries. They were hoping the war would last forever, but you didn't need a war lasting forever for them. This was the true birth of the chemical industries, and it spawned on the birth of all chemicals used in all industries. It led to constant production of industrial chemicals all the way to World War II. Not only was the chemical industry producing for World War II now, but they were producing on a much larger scale for almost all industries around the world, everywhere at that point. Because of this, there was so much overflow of byproduct the industries had to dump some of the chemicals into rivers, lakes, and the ocean. And I'm going to talk about byproduct in a minute, what that means. Byproduct coming off of creating a chemical, not just the chemical itself. The industries, they just dumped it right into rivers. They dumped them into lakes. They dumped them into the ocean. They dumped them everywhere. They were, they were already doing that since the early 1900s. They were already dumping all this stuff everywhere but it was increasing greatly and with more dangerous concoctions. The chemical industries knew if it persisted, our lakes and rivers would die. They would die, and they would die globally. And they knew this. Just like Lake Erie almost was pronounced dead. Almost pronounced completely dead. And when it gets to that point, when a lake actually completely dies, you can't bring it back. 
So the dumping of these chemicals slowed down in the 1960s, and storage bins and storage bins started to accumulate more and more and more around the world. Storage bins of chemicals. You have to understand something. This is important. The process of making chemicals is a wasteful process. In order to make a chemical for a use, there's trial and error. They experiment over and over and over again and create bad batches. They create mistakes nonstop. It's practice is what it is. It's practiced mistakes that have to be discarded. Where does all that practiced mistake go? Millions and millions and billions of botch jobbed gallons have to go somewhere of chemical. So not only do you have the mistakes made as they try to discover a chemical for use, but the byproduct produced is a whole other level of waste, which can lead to millions of gallons on its own. Hey, this might be boring when you think about it to somebody. They're like, I don't want to hear about chemicals. Oh, yeah, you don't? You don't? Okay. You don't want to hear about them? Okay. All right. Okay, you, okay, you live in that world, but you know what? <laughs> you want to know. You want to know what's happening because it involves you. It involves everybody. This isn't just a story about some chemicals or something. This, this is critical information so you can protect your family, so you can protect your loved ones and protect yourself. The byproduct I'm talking about produced, that's a whole nother level of waste. It's not just the chemical that's being produced, but the byproducts, which can lead to, once again, millions and millions and billions of gallons on its own per one chemical. Now, per one chemical, they try to deem useful. This can mean up to a thousand times the byproduct per chemical produced. It could, up to that. This translates to trillions and trillions of of gallons of byproduct over the years. What's byproduct? Deadly waste chemicals, you know, from a chemical when they're trying to make it. That was the method of disposing of the toxic waste. The method was throw it in rivers, throw it in lakes, let it drain into lakes, let it drain in the ocean, but where's it gonna go? You know, in the end, with all of that, trillions of gallons Where's the industry going to store all of those toxic gallons? Because they back down on dumping it in any streams, rivers, and lakes. And, and the ocean back in the 60s, it was back down. And where do you store all that? Because it's going to take up so much land in the world. So much land in the world. Massive amounts. The old method was to dump it, like I said, in our rivers and lakes. And the other old method was to dump it in landfills and toxic dump sites where then the rain would come and the rain would slowly wash small amounts of it back into the ocean, back into the rivers and back into the lakes. This has been ongoing since the early 1900s. It was the older method I'm talking about to discard it and get rid of it. But you'll see why I'm talking about this as we move along. The global chemical, you know, chemical industries had a problem on their hands. They couldn't dump it all in the rivers, oceans, and lakes, not all of it. And there was nowhere to store the mass amounts anymore. There wasn't enough land available to store the surplus of chemicals and the excess byproduct. It would take over planet Earth. We're talking about levels that are so huge and so massive, unthinkable levels and amounts and different kinds of chemicals, thousands of different kinds of chemicals and their byproducts. Before we go further, though, we will talk about those planes we see in the air. So now there's airliners, right? Hey, they have passengers. You guys have been on those planes before. <laughs> they got passengers. You're flying all, flying up there. And then there's cargo planes, and they might have a couple of paths, passengers on there, but they have, you know, packages and shipments and carrying packages all around the globe. But there's another kind of large plane up there. Spirit of Compassion told me about it. It's separate from the other two kinds of planes I just mentioned. These are older airliners. They're older airliners. These airliners are from the late 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s 
and the 90s. These different kind of planes, people used to travel in them. Yeah, airliners is what they were, but not anymore. They fly with no passengers on there anymore. Those days are over. They travel on their own flight patterns, and they land in private airports, their own private airports. These private airports aren't military. They have nothing to do with any world military. And you know what's really weird? They have nothing to do with any world governments. It's a whole other organization built for the chemical industries. And, (laughs) you know, (laughs) I should have my flashlight shining on my face right now as we sit around the campfire. You know, (laughs) get ready for the information, though. And a whole other organization of private contractors built this for the chemical industries. I always tell you guys about the private deals that Spirit of Compassion has told me about all through the years. I tell you about the private deals going on. Here's just another one to add to the list, right? A private deal that was put in place in the 1960s, made without anybody's say or input. No town hall meetings, like I always say. It kind of reminds me of the just like, just like the protein law. Hey, if you're new to medical medium information, you'd be like, what's the protein law? Well, the protein law is something you've been brainwashed with. Okay, <laughs> so you know, all right? Back in the early 1930s, the, the whole thing about protein was purposely done, and it was, in, it was put into schools and all of this information about it. I can give you that another day. You're going to hear about the protein law, and you'll know why you've been brainwashed by the protein law. But, and then there's the autoimmune law, too, where we've been trained that our bodies attack themselves, that we're taught that our body turns against our glands and organs and our body's immune system destroys itself, right? The autoimmune law that started in the 1950s, that private deal that was made that everybody's brainwashed about too, alternative medicine and conventional medicine. Well, we'll talk about those in future episodes. But this was another private deal that was made. These old planes were hollowed out. Tanks were put inside of them. And not the tanks that are theorized now. Not the tanks they, because, you know, people talk about there must be tanks in these planes, right? But these tanks are large tanks, not little tiny ones. They're large tanks. And the, the, these planes are gutted, and these large plastic tanks are installed. The tanks were filled with old chemicals and their byproducts. That's what happened. So the plane is sitting there. A truck comes by and then fills the plane up with these toxic waste chemicals. That's how the system works. The planes land. Once they empty the chemicals, they land. They're in the airport. Trucks come by. They fill up the tanks. Planes take off. It's, and they, they go out, and they're just they're up in the air again. So the global chemical industry was, was harboring for over 50 years since before the 1960s all these toxic chemicals that, are, that they've been holding on to. Because if they dumped everything in the rivers and the lakes and the ocean at once and in landfills throughout the, throughout the whole 1900s and early 1900s, it would have been epic disaster, an epic disaster. So many of the chemicals were held on to and kept in storage vats. The plan was to fill these planes with these chemicals and release them when the planes are up in the sky. You know, is that a nice thing to do? <laughs> I don't think so. The planes go high in the sky and they release these toxic chemicals. So it would slowly thin out over time as these chemicals dissipated. This isn't in just one country, okay? So if you're thinking that in your mind, you're like, whoa, what country am he's talking about? No, no. A global phenomenon, a global deal. The planes are flying all over the entire planet, dropping down these chemicals and chemical byproduct. These old storage vats of chemicals that all these chemical industries had sitting around too, too long. Something happens to these chemicals when they sit around too, too long. On another note, things grow inside of them. Strange forms of bacteria, strange forms of mold, fungus, toxic algae. And that's something you got to remember as we go through the show. Toxic algae. Interesting. You know, like 
red tide kind of stuff, we're going to keep on moving along. New allergens we never even experienced grow in these tanks. This is why the oceans get those algae blooms that actually cause the red tide. By the way, these red tides are a sign of the coming times down, down, down the road, okay? And, you know, long after we're here, but these coming times where the oceans die and turn completely red. You know, the chemicals are producing the overproduction of the toxic algae. That's what happens. The chemicals that are being dropped out of the sky are igniting and proliferating toxic algaes because that's where the toxic algaes are coming from. See, we kind of play stupid down here. We're like testing water. We're testing red tide certain times of the season. Hey, it's dangerous to go in the water. Don't go in that water right now. You might get sick. You know, we're doing little tests on it. But that toxic algae comes from someplace. It didn't come from down here. That toxic algae came from up there and rained down. That's how it works. See, you get microorganisms. They have to survive. They need to survive. And when they sit in these chemical soups, in vats and storage bins, for years and decades, they adapt. The more microorganisms then breed life in there. And then they have to adapt to survive. And that's going to be a whole story for another day on how that works. But let's just keep going. But what you see is not what you get up there in the sky. When you look at the chemtrails in the sky... You might be thinking, oh, wow, that chemtrail now he's talking about. That chemtrail is going to fall on me. I see that one right up there. That one's going to fall on me. Hey, look, there's another one right there. Hey, look, there's 10 over there. Those, guys, those chemtrails are going to hit me now. No, this is a good piece of information to know. The chemtrails you see are not coming down on you. They're not. If you can see it, it's not coming down on you. They're coming down on somebody else miles away. The chemtrail that comes down in you, you can't see. It's already come down. It's already been heading down and comes down. They float through the sky and they dissipate and they drop miles after miles after miles. And they fall down on somebody else, the ones you see in the sky anyway. So the planes, they drop these chemical soups all day, all night, nonstop. But nonstop. All night, all day, all night, (laughs) all day. Chemical byproducts are forever being produced by the chemical industry. If you're wondering what byproduct I'm talking about, it's endless, really. I mean, it's endless. So many things that are man-made out there. They pro- everything man-made produces chemical byproduct <laughs> from many industries, including the petrochemical industries throughout the world, the entire world. The byproduct is highly toxic, and it can't be dumped in the ocean, like I said, in one shot. You dump all this in the ocean in one shot, shot you guys, and the ocean's dead. That's it. Every, the whales die. Everything dies. That would happen. You dump all this stuff. If, all the, if the chemical industry opened up the floodgates and let everything roll into the ocean at once, all their backlog, their trillions of gallons, the ocean would die in one shot and turn deep red, blood red, and every single dolphin would die. You know, a fraction of this byproduct, just a fraction of this byproduct I'm talking about sent down a major river would kill the entire river and all the foliage and plant life within the river and around it. It has to be dropped strategically. The chemicals have to be dropped strategically out of planes in our atmosphere to thin out and spaced out enough so it doesn't show the immediate harm on our environment and nature. Spirit of Compassion says to me, and always has, the plan is, as you drop it slowly, Spirit of Compassion told me, as you drop it slowly out of the sky, it gives our oceans, rivers, and lakes, and forests time to adapt. I always, that always blew my mind. Spirit of Compassion would say it lessens the shock on the environment. It gives everything a chance to adapt. And that was wild to me. That was wild. The other plan was for some of it to stay in the clouds, intermixed with precipitation, and become somewhat diffused. 
by the living water. That's rain. Rain's, rain's electric. It's electric. That's what rain is. It's got a charge to it. And that living water, that charge, that was, that was part of the plan, that it could diffuse some of it. So the plan was hopefully it stays in a lot of clouds. You've heard about acid rain, right? Yeah. Acid rain. Hmm. You know, the, the thing that everybody says smog is the culprit for. But there's much more than that. It's much more than just smog. Yeah. It's a lot to do with the chemtrails. Because the chemtrails, a lot of it, a decent amount of it, does stay up there. And it eventually comes down in the rain. <laughs> I talked about rain being toxic and you don't want, if you're somebody that's sick and you got symptoms, if you're hypersensitive, you don't want to be drenched by the rain all the time because you might feel a little sick and a little sicker along the way. You know, look, chemtrails is why our skies aren't blue anymore, okay? And they're hazy blue, the chemicals that stay in the air and hover before they even drop change the color color of our sky. Look, you might be somebody that's young, and when you're young, you just think the sky's as blue as it is, and that's it. But when you talk to older people, like older people, they're like, they know what a deep blue sky looks like. You know, photographs from our skies, you guys, in the 1940s and the 1950s and early 1960s are vastly different than our photographs today of a sky. Unless you put filters on them and Photoshop them and change the colors with your computer, right? What a game that is. Unbelievable. Hiding the sky. We mostly have misty baby blue skies now, not rich, clear blue skies. We have become the frog in a pot of boiling water in some respects. Each new generation doesn't know how rich and clear and blue the sky was in the past. You are born and raised with the new sky we have, which is all you know. Just like the frog doesn't know the temperature of the water is getting hot until it's too late, we don't know the skies are becoming less blue. <laughs> when the chemtrails accumulate, they shadow areas of the world, wreaking havoc on epic levels because of the drowning out of our sun. It changes the weather. It does. Interesting. It changes the weather. Our weather has changed. Our climate has changed because of chemtrails. And I'm not talking about the cloud seeding trail that is known or the cloud seeding technique that is known where they use barium and other substances to manipulate precipitation. Chemtrails is a whole other thing going on. It's separate from cloud seeding. That's a whole another point to know. The chemtrails, they cause droughts in places that shouldn't have droughts. They can cause more rain in areas it shouldn't. Chemtrails interferes with weather patterns because the chemicals harbor metals, and metals interfere with electrical activities of our skies. Because our skies are electrical. It creates storms where storms shouldn't be created. It even manipulates hurricanes, cyclones, and tornadoes. But even worse, our polar caps are melting because of chemtrails. I don't think you guys saw that one coming, right? Because I know there's a lot of polar cap people that are worried. And you're just like, oh my God, the polar caps are melting. There's a lot of people out there like, I get asked that. I get asked all kinds of questions. I got friends that ask me questions all through the years. I mean, you wouldn't believe what people ask me. When, when they know me, they'll be like, look, tell me, tell me the hard truth about something. I'll be like, what? What? <laughs> and the polar caps, yeah. And it causes the waters to rise. Yeah, is the waters rising? Yeah, they're rising ever so, so slowly, but they're rising. But the chemtrails are the true reason why the waters are rising at all. Not the fake reason, which is just smog and animal pollution and people pollution. Those are bad. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> smog is terrible. Pollution's bad but they're nothing like chemtrails. Here's the, the strange thing about chemtrails. Governments have nothing to do with chemtrails. World governments all around, all around the planet have nothing to do with the chemtrails. How weird is that? And they have no power to stop them either or even understand them. It's a private club. 
And the power behind this club is like no other. Governments have to pretend it's not happening. Like they just whistle like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. no, that's not happening. Nope, nope. I don't see, you know, <laughs> I don't see any trails in this guy. I don't know what that is. <laughs> they got to pretend it doesn't exist. You know, what's funny too, is it makes the pharmaceutical industry look like friendly, happy, and safe. <laughs> you know, like, it makes big pharma look like awesome. Just like they've never done wrong. They can't do wrong. Big pharma is like, Incredible. They can't do no wrong ever with anything. You know, how do you solve a problem that no one really knows about? How do you solve a problem that is above all laws? <laughs> how do you solve a problem that's global? I can't solve the problem. I can't get people off of eggs. <laughs> I can't get people off of eggs. Eggs that are feeding the viruses that are responsible for chronic fatigue and all their other symptoms and conditions. You know, eggs being one of the things that actually feed bugs. And then the bugs are responsible. These viruses are responsible. So I can't get people off of eggs. I can't get people off of nutritional yeast. With all that MSG, they don't know they're eating. So I know I can't solve this problem. I can't. Spirit of Compassion told me when I was young that the Man Poison Club is an evil machine. From what I learned from Spirit of Compassion... You don't stop it and you don't fight it because you'll never win. At least not that way. You have to accept it and then you rise above it. Spirit of Compassion told me you rise above it. Why am I talking about this now? You know, and I waited for years. Well, you know, I'm always focused on you guys with chronic illness and all the symptoms and conditions and hundreds of symptoms and conditions that medical medium information has reversed and saved lives for so many years. And then the advanced medical information alternative health that, that, that Spirit of Compassion put out there for years, a lot of it that goes right back to me, some of it that got lost in the woodwork out there, and people use little tidbits from Spirit of Compassion and don't even know where it comes from. But out of all that, you know, I'm always focused on getting you guys better. And, well, I waited for years for somebody else to discover what was really going on. I mean, it's kind of that thing where I bring out all those hard truths about the caffeine industry, and I bring out the truth about autoimmune, and I bring out the truth about how to heal in the viruses and what viruses and how, they been, have, how they've been let out in our environment all these decades and why people are sick with chronic symptoms and conditions. I bring out all these truths that no one brings out in the alternative movement on any level <laughs> or conventional movement on any level. I'm busy with all that. So I just kind of sat back and I'm like, you know what? I mean, someone's got to figure this out. I, I can't do it all. I, I can't do it all. I can't just, I mean, I have so much on my plate to deliver out there. So you would think by now someone could have had figured it out or what's really going on, but it's above anything we understand. So I understand why they haven't. I mean, look, I have to get the information from Spirit of Compassion. And yeah, look, if you're a naysayer or somebody, call it a theory if you want, if that makes you feel good. If you're somebody else, call it make-believe if you want, if it makes you feel good, whatever, whatever works. But here's the problem. It's going to get worse and worse and worse over time. The amount of planes that have been increased just in the last 30 years is remarkable. Remarkable. The fleets are massive and growing larger, and they run all day and all night, and they never stop. That's how much chemical is being poured on everyone. In the future, you won't really see a video on any reality TV show or a video or photograph on someone's social media page with a sky free of chemtrails. Contrails don't leave a long trail. They dissipate fast. And it only extends the small distance from the jet engines. Chemtrails go for a long, long way. They can go for miles and miles. As the planes are flying, the pilot swips a, he flips a switch. <laughs> so that's what happens. There's this pilot on the plane. He's got a switch to his side, and he clicks the button. He just he's, he flips the switch. And then the pump goes on. So there's a pump go into the tanks. And so the pump turns on and it pumps the stuff out of the tanks, the chemicals out of the tanks while the plane is flying. And then spouts on the side of the plane that are bolted to the sides of the plane because they're fabricated and built that way. And these, these, these jets, these spout jets on the side of the plane release the chemical as the pump is pumping it out of the big tanks 
and then <laughs> and then the chemical comes shooting out of the spouts attached to the plane. Sometimes you'll see a trail go on for miles, right? And then it'll stop. Ten miles later, you'll see the, it go on again, meaning you'll see the trail start again. The pilot is actually switching a switch on and off at the pilot's own discretion. Some pilots go 20 miles before they switch it on and off. No rhyme or reason in many cases. It depends on what mood the pilot's in or maybe the pilot's new to it all. It's first time on the job and he releases it all at once and then <laughs> lands <laughs> empty. The, the pilot's job is to spread it on and off through the whole duration of that flight. People who are aware of chemtrails think that it comes out of the engines like, they think that must be where the trail is coming from. It doesn't come out of the engines. That's not the fuel burning. That's what, not what that is. The spirit of compassion fills me in on these techniques. And look, you can witness some of this yourself if you pay attention and you look up at the sky. But I know a lot of people, they're, they're a little too busy and they're not looking at the sky at all. What's interesting about chemtrails is that the activity of chemtrails is heightened in areas where people will be outside more, you know, during holidays and gatherings and vacation times of the year, or when people are just outside more when the weather's really good. And that's when more activity is happening, not because people are there and they're seeing it, not at all. And that's not it. But way more activity, more chemtrails are being dropped everywhere, covering skies when people are out more. It's gone beyond the process of getting rid of just chemicals and byproduct. Um, spirit of compassion <laughs> filled me in that there might have been maybe the first intention originally, which is get rid of the byproduct, get rid of the chemicals. That was the safest way someone thought the problem could be dealt with. And you know what? Maybe there was a little bit of innocence originally with the problem. Maybe at the very beginning in the 60s, someone was worried about dumping everything directly in the lakes because the demand, the chemical industry was so, you know, strong. And they were thinking maybe this was the best idea as you put it up in planes and you slowly drop it out. And maybe they had a good think tank with it too, a lot of big thinkers. But I think there could be a second intention. You know, the fact that they drop more of it when everybody's around. Spirit of Compassion told me that it's possible that, yeah, there's a second intention that developed because whenever the weather is nice, like I said, holidays around the world and so forth, it the activity increases greatly. Areas are strategically mapped out all around the world. There is a method to this madness. You guys, there's a method to this madness. It's the ultimate trick played upon us. So you're taking your selfie. You have the sky behind you. And there's a streak going across the sky. It's something I've learned to accept throughout the decades in my life as I look up and I see them all, that there's no fixing it. It's one example of how we have a spiritual war happening. You, you might have heard me mention spiritual war recently. I'm going to be talking about that more and more and more, what's happening. It's good versus evil. Oh, wait, wait, <laughs> you might be somebody that doesn't think there's anything bad going on. You might be somebody that doesn't think there's evil on any level, and you think maybe everybody has a good heart, you know, or everybody is just kind of misdirected, but they're really good inside, and they do bad things, and no, there's, there's darkness. There is. <laughs> there is. You know, to be more precise, hey, evil tricking the good, how about that, instead of good versus evil? evil tricking the good. So the good doesn't even know there is a fight. One of the examples of how we have evil people in the world using their free will, well, this is definitely one of those examples of people doing evil things. It's a prime example of how things aren't what they seem to be, and we stay distracted on other environmental projects. I'm wondering if you're thinking about that a little bit. While this thing that I'm talking about here, the chemtrail saga, the chemtrail game, while this one is completely ignored, organizations that are formed to protect the environment, right, many that you know, they're aware of these chemtrails, but they just ignore them too because they got to. They know they have to. There's no way of addressing it. it. Look, 
they are not aware of the complexities maybe of these chemtrails at all. Who is? Nobody really is. Nobody is. But nevertheless, they're aware of something happening up there. These chemtrails are responsible for the flocks of birds that mysteriously died. Did you guys ever hear about that? Have you ever seen that where out of nowhere, a thousand birds die and they're all over the streets and all over a village and all over a town or they're all over a, a, a baseball diamond somewhere or they're all over a, a field somewhere and someone you know, stumbles across them, all these flocks of birds dying everywhere around the planet at once. The birds that swarm and migrate just die and they hit the ground and they rain. It's raining birds. Why is that happening? The birds are hitting pockets of these chemtrails up in the sky because the chemtrails vary from super, super toxic, sometimes deadly toxic, sometimes partially toxic, somewhat dangerous. And because it's different batches of old poisonous toxins you know, and stockpiles from any decade that could be loaded up into the plane and dropped over in the present moment right now that's been in storage forever. So these birds hit these pockets of dangerous chemicals up in the sky and birds that are migrating in massive swarms and and, and swarms and flocks, occasionally they run into this thick vapor and then dead birds rain on the towns. And here's the sad part. That's just when we see the birds what about in all the places the birds fly, the wilderness, the forests, and you don't see them fall and die in there? You know, like if a tree falls in the woods, you know, if you don't hear it, did it really fall or whatever? You know, that whole saying, you guys could probably, you guys could say that better than I could right now, I'm sure. But, well, hey, if a thousand birds at a clip fall into the forest... And no one hears it, no one sees it. Did it really happen? Yeah, it did. It did happen. It did. Because, because birds fly in these swarms and flocks over vast amounts of land that are not populated by humans. Chemtrails will be the end of our birds in the coming years. Way down the road, birds won't be chirping. There are less birds now than ever before in our history. And then, hey, I got to drop this one on you right now. I just, you know, did you, did you, do you have your tea, your herbal tea? Are you relaxing? Are you sitting down? What about the bees? You guys care about the bees, right? I know I do. I have a bee meditation in the medical medium book one, along with other powerful meditations that have, have helped people heal. Well, you guys care about the bees. There are theories that maybe it's the GMO food killing the bees. Oh, I could see it now. Someone just got upset. They're saying, wait a minute, he's pro-GMO. No, I'm not. <laughs> Anybody who knows me knows that's the last thing if you read my books. I'm not pro-GMO, okay? And I tell you things about GMO people don't know about in the GMO industry. But, but, the, but from Spirit of Compassion, of course, it's where I get my unique original information. But here's the thing, you know, yeah, GMO food is not helping out the bees. It's true. For, for a mul multitude of reasons, and I know that, but there's a more predominant problem. The chemtrails, the chemtrails are killing the bees. Yes, <laughs> the chemtrails rain on the beekeeper and the bees. It's crazy how that works, right? Isn't that bizarre? You know how the beekeeper is smoking out the bees to get the honey? <laughs> a little smoke, <laughs> smoke canister? Well, the chemtrails are smoking out the beekeeper as he's doing that, and the bees. What's the irony to that one? <laughs> it's, so, it's so crazy. You know, when the bees are docile and they're crawling around on the ground and they're just dying a slow death, have you ever seen a honeybee just crawling around and you're like, honeybee, I want to help you. I want to help you get to a flower. I want to get you to a flower. Get a little twig, get a leaf, and get the honeybee as he's crawling. He must just need to go back on his flower and get some nectar. Maybe he's unhappy. What's wrong with him? And how many times have you heard that? I mean, I've not only heard that, but I've seen that myself. I've seen it. I've seen people talk to me about it. Like, oh my God, you wouldn't believe these bees are crawling on the ground. And somebody would be like, well, it's the time of the season. Well, did the bee sting you? And then the stinger's gone. And that's why the bee's crawling on the ground? No. No, that's not why the bee's crawling on the ground. <laughs> you know, when those bees are docile like that and crawling on the ground like that, they're dying a slow death because of chemtrails. Birds and bees are canaries in the coal mine. 
They go first before us. And guess what goes next? The dragonflies, they're dying. They're the other canary. They're getting sicker and sicker and sicker and slower and slower than ever. And we need those dragonflies. We need those desperately. Butterflies. Bye-bye butterflies for the future because butterflies are going to take a big hit, big hit from the chemtrails, and they already are. And then we have the schools of fish. Wait a minute, you know, the schools of fish that die by the hundreds of thousands in our oceans, they wash up on the shore and everybody's smelling dead fish and freaking out. Environmentalists are testing the water and freaking out. And nobody knows what happened at all. It's just nobody knows what happened. And all these fish are just sharks too. Sharks, everything is just coming up. Swordfish, everything, any kind of fish is just, you know, sea bass. Everything's just washing up dead. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable as it's sitting on the beach rotting. And then you hear, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe it was the algae bloom, an algae bloom. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, sure, of course. Where'd that algae bloom come from? How does that work? That's why you see from time to time the stories out there devastating about, you know, the amount of dead fish and other sea life. What about other sea life, not even fish, just on the shore rotting? And what about all the kill-offs that aren't being talked about or seen? That's just the ones that are seen. You know, Spirit of Compassion, you know, tells me about these chemical soups that drop out of the plains and what they do, they pull you know, they pull in areas of the ocean that are more stagnant because of different currents. So the chemical soups that have this mutated toxic algae that's 50, 60 years old sometimes that just came out of an old tank and was just recently stuck into a plane and then dumped on us, that algae, okay, that dangerous toxic stuff it ends up proliferating and thriving in more stagnant areas, naturally stagnant because of just the current of, you know, eddies and oceans and and movement and all that. And then fish swimming along, they're trying to get food. Whoa, schools of fish are like, whoa, we got some good stuff to eat. We're going, we're going. And they hit these pools of chemicals and toxic mutated microorganisms and algae, and they die fast, just like birds instantly. They just die and it's immediately fatal for the fish and the birds. Welcome to the chemtrails. Welcome to the chemtrails. In 20 years from now, the plane fleets will be increased greatly. The goal is to have a vast fleet. The chemtrail planes already take up a large percentage of the sky as far as with the flight patterns and everything. And you know what's crazy is (laughs) the flight towers... They just have to ignore it. I mean, forget the radar. Well, what are all these planes? Oh, they're not passenger planes, and what are they? Everybody has to ignore it. That is really interesting, right? I know everybody's worried about 5G right now, and I'm going to talk about 5G eventually and go into that, and if if it affects our health or if not or however, I'm going to go into that whole thing. We're going to cover it, and we're going to get there. Don't worry. And Spirit and Compassion will have powerful information. Nobody knows about it. Meanwhile, no one's worried about the chemtrail game. And yeah, it's a game. It's a sick game. I call it a game because Spirit of Compassion tells me it's become one. It has. You know, Spirit of Compassion tells me that the industry, the chemical industries worldwide, they want us focused on other targets, you know? They want us focused on 5G. They want us focused on anything else that's bad. They just don't want it focused on those chemtrails that's bad. I call it a game, like I said, because it's become one. And look, they want us focused on this. They want us focused on plastic bags, which is it's good focus. It is. They want us to focus on cups and straws and toilet paper rolls, you know, like empty toilet paper rolls, <laughs> cans and bottles. Uh, they want us focused on creating less trash. I think it's all important. I stand behind all of that. That That is important because it, it is, right? But, you know, Yeah, it's like when I'm taking the bottles, you know, and I'm taking whatever, like the recyclables to the garbage, and I look up and I see the chemtrails up there. Uh, I I mean, yeah, I'm looking at all the chemtrails in the sky while I'm trying to recycle stuff. It's, it's, It's a tough one to swallow, right? I don't know. 
it's it's hard for me because I'm like, maybe what? Because I know so much about this stuff. And you're just like, you're looking up at the sky and you see 10 chemtrails. And you're like, well, what brew is that? Is that from 20 years ago? Is that from 60 years ago? What kind of toxic crap is that coming down? Is it a pesticide, you know, byproduct? Is it an herbicide byproduct? What could, what could it be? And, you know, you sit there and then you put your recyclables in the bin. And look... I mean, you can look in the sky many times and you'll see 30, 40 chemtrails just drifting along. They drift along forever. But I get it. We have to do our part and we have to be mindful about the environment, which I stand behind 100%. We're being mindful and they're playing a sick joke on us. (laughs) And look, maybe you don't see it that way. I kind of do a little bit. The chemtrails... They settle in the early morning dew. So check this out. This is an important piece of information. The chemtrails, they're falling all night long. And they fall during the day too, but there's a difference. In the morning, right around dawn, there's this moisture that occurs. And that moisture ends up on your car windshield. That moisture ends up on the grass in the summertime where it's wet in the morning. And you'll find that happening a lot. And when you're walking along, you can even get soaking wet in the grass if you're walking on a lawn, you know, first thing in the morning early. That moisture holds in the air in the morning and it holds on and suspends all that chemtrail that's been dropped down. And it tends to harbor underneath the tree line. So when people are jogging and they're jogging, they're running in the morning out and they're out in the streets jogging, running wherever they are or they're walking on trails or wherever it is, they're inhaling more. They're inhaling more of the chemtrails at that time in the morning. It hasn't kind of lifted and blown away yet. It hasn't kind of moved and shaken out of it. So when we're doing our workouts and we're doing that, we're breathing in and inhaling more chemtrail and we're sweating and we're absorbing it into our pores. That's what happens. And, you know, that's why, look, we'll talk about some tips and some things to just think about, protect yourselves and everything and all that coming up. But check this out. Our skies are supposed to be sacred, right? I mean, do you think our skies are sacred? Do they mean something to you when you look up into the sky? I mean, you look up there. Do you ever lay on your back on the ground and you're looking at the clouds as they're changing shape and you see different shapes in the clouds and we look up, look at them in awe and we think about the things. Hey, there's a horse up there. Look, that cloud looks like a horse. Hey, that cloud looks like something else. And what about the fact that we pray too? So many people pray and the sky means everything. What about meditation? We meditate with a sensation of something above us, don't we? Like when you meditate... Are you thinking or feeling something above you when you're meditating, like the sky or the universe, that feeling above us? And, you know, children fly kites, right? In the sky, you look at the sky and you're flying a kite on a windy day. We feel the sunshine on our faces and we look at the falling stars at night. Have you ever looked for falling stars and you dream? And we look at the constellations Meanwhile, what's going on here on our planet, yeah, is sad and corrupt. This is one of the many reasons why I get disappointed when people in the health movement don't think we need to cleanse. And I'm going to repeat that for a second. People in the health movement, yeah, there's many of them that don't think we need to cleanse. And if they do think we need to cleanse, it's a cleanse that doesn't get any cleansing done. But... And if you're new to medical medium information, you can learn about cleansing everything sure and all that and making sure you're doing it in a really good way, a healthy way. And, you know, health professionals and hobbyists, hacks and health influencers and influencers don't know what's causing our illness. Um, They don't know why everybody has chronic fatigue syndrome and all the different autoimmune varieties and, and rheumatoid arthritis and Hashimoto's thyroiditis and fatigue anxiety and and, you know, everything else, all the tingles and numbness and the aches and pains and depression. People don't know why chronic illness is still just completely not understood and misunderstood. Unless they've gotten tidbits from medical medium information throughout the years, you know, like celery juice, therapeutically 16 ounces or 32 ounces or 64 ounces on an empty stomach and how to use it, making sure you don't mix anything with it. The world wasn't drinking celery juice before Spirit of Compassion put it out there and in the way therapeutically like, you know, he has. But everybody's a health expert these days. But what's interesting about everybody being a health expert these days, they don't have a clue about why we're even sick or what we're even up against. And 
This is just one reason why we have to take care of ourselves is because of this very reason here. The same reason why nobody knew what was happening with these chemtrails. People who believe chemtrails exist don't know how it works and everything else. And I'm giving you the, I'm giving you the information right now. But hey, that's what I mean. There's even more things than that. There's so much more. And look what's in the medical medium books about why we're sick. There's a reason why we have to take care of ourselves. We need extra help, but we need the right tools. Your body needs to be validated. It needs to know you understand its fight. Like you understand what it's up against. Your body needs to not only have like the right tools that you possess to offer your body, but it needs to know you're in the game, that you're in it with it. And that's the whole thing because our bodies are on their own. And then we're all playing guessing games. That's how it works out there. You know, it's like people, they'd rather just think that maybe, you know, their health problem is a little bit, their gut, their microbiome's off or something, their gut floor is off. And that's why everything like it's all in their gut. And that's why they're sick. And that's why they have eczema or acne or any kind of other condition or fatigue. And maybe they think it's genetics too, or it's hormones, or they need to be rewired and it's all in their head. Like their train of thought isn't good and it's time to rewire their mind or get their meditations right. And, you know, and maybe it's okay if it's autoimmune and your body's attacking itself kind of thought, but people, they just, don't really give their bodies the understanding their body needs. And that's a problem out there. And I know a lot of people, they believe they're health experts or they want to become health experts and they don't know what we're really up against or what causes Hashimoto's thyroiditis or what causes rheumatoid arthritis or what causes chronic fatigue or eczema and psoriasis and anxiety and tickles and numbness and aches and pains and vertigo. And if you don't know what causes all that, and then you don't know what contributes to all of that, and your body's like, hey, help me. Um, no, it's it's not leaky gut. <laughs> nope. Um, it's no apple cider vinegar isn't the answer. <laughs> it never got anybody with lupus healed. Um, uh, apple cider vinegar never uh, got somebody better with multiple sclerosis, uh, please, uh, I need the answers here. I need help. I need you to believe in me and know what's wrong. There's toxic heavy metals and there's chemtrails falling out of the sky and there's pathogens and bacteria and viruses and there's the Epstein bar and all in petrochemicals in our system and everything else. And I need you to work with me here. And that's what our bodies are like wanting, but we get thrown off track and, and it happens every day. I see it out there. People are worried about collagen and you know, I get, I get it, but they're doing that while they're guzzling down coffee and burning out their adrenals. I think, look, the bottom line is it's about like, are you going to work with your body? Because it's not hopeless. It's not. And I still got to, I got to cover more on chemtrails. I'm still heading in there. We got more information about chemtrails that I have to talk about, but it's not hopeless when you work with your body and you look out for it and you understand it and it understands you. And we just, we work together as the chemtrails fall out of the sky, they have to land somewhere. And you might be somebody that's like, Hey, I eat really good food. I eat grass fed beef, but the chemtrails, they got to land on the fields and the rain washes them into the earth too. And if you maybe you're maybe you don't eat animal products, maybe you're vegan, maybe you're plant based, and all the chemtrails just on all our vegetables, it's on <laughs> everything we eat, and the soil gets disrupted because it gets depleted of zinc. Nobody knows about this information. I've talked about that. Metals fall from the sky. That's the chemtrails I've been talking about all these years, you guys. Metals fall from the skies, they soak into the store, they soak into the soil, and they destroy microorganisms, the soil-borne microorganisms in the soil. They kill the soil and they deplete it of zinc, and our soil becomes immune deficient. That's what happens from chemtrails. Now, look, we still need to eat our foods, we still need to eat, you know, our, our organic foods. We can't get it organic, we get, you know, conventional, but the point is, is that we need to take care of our bodies while we're eating and living here. We have to adapt. And then if you're doing the animal proteins, well, I do, I do grass-fed beef. Somebody might say, I got it down. I'll do a little grass-fed beef. I do free-range chicken or whatever. And 
animals or I do lamb or something, animals graze. Any kind of animals that graze and they're eating grass or they're eating meal of some kind that was raised either way with chemtrails falling on it, it was grown with chemtrails falling on it, either way, animals that graze in the grass, that grass is loaded with chemtrails and it builds up in concentrations inside the animals. So that grass-fed beef or grass-fed butter will still have concentrations of chemical soup that won't even be tested because they don't, they're not testing for that. They're not finding what's in chemtrails in our food that builds up in our bodies when you eat it. They're not looking because they don't even know what to look for. Guess what? Because 90% of the chemicals falling out of the sky from these chemtrails are unidentified. They're privatized chemicals. They're secret soups and recipes made by the chemical industry that don't even they have their own, that don't even have patents, never mind the ones that are patented. They're still their own recipe. No one knows what's in most of this stuff, especially their mistakes and their test ones, or their test runs. Nobody knows what's in this stuff. So it's not even anybody's even testing this stuff in our food. That's how sad it is. And if you don't know how to assist your body in getting this stuff out of you, well, it leads to problems down the road. And you might be somebody that's like, I don't want to know about it. I don't want to know. I got a friend that's like that. Just doesn't want to know. Doesn't want to know what's being dropped on them. Rather just, you know, I want a glass of wine and just leave me alone and I kind of want to do my thing. Sure, okay, fine, fine. When you're sick down the road, whatever. And But the thing is that zinc deficiencies we all have you know, that's because the soil is getting depleted by chemtrails as being a big part of it. And when we have no zinc in us or very little zinc in us, it's why we get sick from viruses, any kind of virus, a virus that's going around, whatever, any kind of virus, the Epstein bars that people are passing around, the shingles viruses, the HHV6s, the HHV7s, the simplex ones and simplex two. Just because you had a cold sore years ago doesn't mean that simplex virus isn't living inside of our livers and our bodies and wreaking havoc and giving us other symptoms. See, nobody knows all this information. They just don't understand that. But, you know, in order to adapt, in order to take care of ourselves, we have to adapt. And that's a big part of it. And you know what's funny? All the information Spirit of Compassion gives me and the volumes I put out there and the frontier, head of frontier, groundbreaking information in the alternative medicine, conventional medicine that, that I've put out over the years. And with all of that, you'll hear out there, lymphatic system, Anthony doesn't know about the lymphatic system. He doesn't know, he doesn't know anything about the lymphatic system. It's like, <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> like, oh my God, do you know anything about the chemtrails? <laughs> you know, never mind that. And and it's interesting, you'll hear it from people like, he doesn't know about the lymphatic system. You'll hear that from people that don't know why anyone's sick. They don't know why people have viruses or what kind of viruses or why people are sick with anything or where toxic heavy metals sit in the liver and the brain or any of that stuff. And if they did get a tidbit of that somewhere, so 35 years of work of putting it out there, Spirit of Compassion's work all these years, you know, the health movement, it was a small, small world. It still is now. But it was a small world back 35 years ago, really, really small. And so that information, I just put it out there and put it out there and put it out there. You know, but what's interesting about the lymphatic system is people be like, hey, isn't it all about the lymphatic system? Are you kidding? I've written about it in the books. But that's coming from people who don't even know why anybody's sick, like I said before. And really, you got to go deeper past the lymphatic system that's where you have to go. You have to go where real problems are inside the body, like bigger problems, much bigger problems, like deep in the liver, because that's what I've been talking about all these years and all these years. The lymphatic system cleanses out its poison by default on its own. It's doing that as you live and breathe and, and live your life. But if your liver's clogged up and stagnant and sluggish and you've got low-grade viruses nobody wants to know about, because the lymphatic system isn't why you have lupus. Your lymphatic, like the lymphatic system isn't causing that. Your lymphatic system's not causing neurological symptoms. It's not causing tingles and numbness and aches and pains and ticks and spasms and burning skin and floaters in the eyes and severe fatigue. Your lymphatic system doesn't do that. It doesn't create, it's not causing your edema. 
It's coming from a deeper source. It's coming from pathogens. Your lymphatic system doesn't cause lupus. It doesn't cause Hashimoto's. It doesn't cause Lyme. It doesn't cause, yeah, that's what's so funny. It's like, oh, it's the lymphatic system. That's really interesting. But, you know, your lymphatic system's health happens to be a direct result of your liver's health. It's a direct result of if you have pathogens and that's what people all have and they're all passing around. And if you're just focused on the lymphatic system, but not the real problem, it's like cleaning your house. You know, you're cleaning your house, you're cleaning your bedroom, you're cleaning your rooms, you're cleaning your bathroom, you're cleaning your kitchen spotless, you're scrubbing your kitchen sink, you know, you're trying, you're cleaning it all, that's your lymphatic system, you know, you're cleaning everything. Meanwhile, your basement has rats festering in it, mice festering in it, roaches, ants, and termites, and they live in your basement, and they're breeding and nesting and devouring the very foundation of your house, but you're worried about your lymphatic system, and you're cleaning the up upstairs there, and you're cleaning the upstairs, and you're not even, you're, you know, that's the thing. So people pretending the lymphatic system is why we're sick is really a joke. I mean, that's a joke. I mean, that's 101, um, let's see, beginners, Back, I don't know, uh, years ago when nobody knew what why anybody's sick. And once again, well, is it candida? Uh, is it lymphatic system? Is it gut? Is it, what is it? It's back to that game. So it's kind of sad. And when I see that out there, it's kind of sad. Meanwhile, yeah, you drink your celery juice and you're going to go for the deeper problems therapeutically. You do your heavy metal detox smoothie. You go for the deeper problems therapeutically. You go with 32 ounces of lemon water. You go to the deeper root, like deeper. And then that's just the start of some of the medical medium tools that got around over the last 35 plus years. And so when you talk about the lymphatic system, you miss the point of altogether about everything else, the pathogens, everything we're dealing with, all the toxins, like from the chemtrails we inhale daily that have to go into the liver because that's where they go. They go into the liver and all these other toxins. They just go and they, they make our liver sick and stagnant. And that has to get sick and stagnant first for your lymphatic system to even have any issues. You have, there has to be a sicker, deeper problem you know, I'll be talking about the lymphatic system in the future. We're going to do a whole podcast inside and out about the lymphatic system. But why do I want you to do lemon water in the morning? More than eight ounces, much more than eight ounces. Why do I want you to do lemon water 16 to 32 ounces? Because it's purifying more than just your lymphatic system. I'm trying to go for the deeper stuff. I'm trying to go for the deeper stuff, not the surface stuff. I'm not trying to go for the surface stuff. The lymphatic system isn't why somebody's bedridden and they got like the worst hives and lupus and migraines and trigeminal neuralgia and their back is killing them and they could barely walk and their feet hurt. That's not the lymphatic system. I mean, it's so embarrassing when I think about it. It's so beginner stupid. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just, look, anyway, <laughs> The, the, the lemon water is critical for flushing to get to the deep rooted things. The celery juice is critical for using it therapeutically to destroy pathogens that are deep inside the liver, deep inside our organs that are in their bloodstream and so forth, you know, and the celery juice is disarming these toxins that fall from the sky and all that stuff. See, the tools are all here. I've always had you in mind for what we face and what you don't know you face out there. Chemtrails are a part of the spiritual war that's going on around us and above us. Mercury is part of that spiritual war that's going around us. The caffeine industry is part of that spiritual war that's going on around us. So many pieces of the puzzle that show us there's good versus evil and how evil looks for ways to control people and then keeps them controlled and then gets them sick and has the thirst to keep them sick forever if possible and then wants them relying on everything they just don't really need. Darkness never wants our eyes open and see what's in the sky and above the trees. It would rather have us unknowing it's time and then bring us to our knees. 
They keep us busy down here, distracted. Some are bored. They want us to lose ourselves in our minds while all the bad around us keeps getting ignored. There is hope. When you're empowered, though, you have the truth on your side and the knowledge, and you support your body with what it needs, and you understand your body as it cries for help and asks you please. When you're on the same page with your body, then you're in the game. See, that's what matters in order to let the good things in life remain. When you have the tools and you apply them right, you are unstoppable against evil and you're gaining all the insight. Because as they drop that stuff down on us, you can laugh at it as it's coming on down. It's not going to get in your way because you're taking care of yourself now. You can say, I'm in control of my life. I got the wisdom. I got the deep spiritual insight. I have control over my well-being. You're not going to take control over me. See, I can live my life the way I want to be and keep from getting sick and recover if I've been sickened if need be. I'm not blind when I look at the sky. The wool's not over my eyes anymore. I can see past the horizon. I can see past the madness. I can see past the smoke and see past the fog. I can use my own free will to determine where life is gonna go for me. I can fight to be free and heal my body and see the path where it's going for me. Remember this, your body has the power to heal and can override through thick and thin, and our bodies fight for us as we acknowledge and validate our bodies fight along the way. Then nothing can get in the way. See, I believe in you, and I know you can heal. As you guys know, I'm not a doctor. Any information you learned here, feel free to take to your doctor or healthcare provider. If you found this show helpful and informative, feel free to share it with someone in need of the information. If you like this show, please subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also find me on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram at Medical Medium. And for more information on healing, please visit medicalmedium.com. Thank you so much for listening.